On the battlefield, the war in Ukraine has been a major failure for Russia. Even so, this is not the only bad political military news the Kremlin has endured lately. One of the main arguments Moscow used to try to justify its atrocious invasion was to prevent NATO from continuing to expand eastward at all costs. According to the Russian government, this was an absolutely unacceptable risk for them. Yet, today, visual politic viewers, things have taken a 180 degree turn. The invasion of Ukraine made countries like Finland and Sweden think about changing their status. If up up until now, they had preferred to stay independent, the invasion convinced them that this was no longer advisable. They had to join NATO. Finland did so in April 2023. Tomorrow we will um, welcome Finland uh, as the 31st member of NATO, making Finland safer and our alliance stronger. We will raise the Finnish flag for the first time here at the NATO headquarters. Sweden, however, has had it much harder until now. In the end, and despite all the back and forth that we will get into in this video, Sweden will become the 32nd member of the Atlantic Alliance. And pay attention, because this is not something that Russia is at all amused about. In fact, check out their typical reactions over the years. Russian ambassador, if Sweden joins NATO, there will be consequences. Putin pointed out that there will be consequences, that Russia will have to resort to a military-type response and redirect our troops and missiles. Russia simulated nuclear attack on Sweden, NATO admits. With an area of about 174,000 square miles, or 450,000 square kilometers, and almost 11 million inhabitants, Sweden is the third largest country in the European Union and the great Scandinavian powerhouse. The question is, why is Sweden of such concern to the Kremlin? What exactly does the inclusion of this country mean for NATO? Is this really something that Russia should be concerned about? What will change from now on? Well, in this video, we're going to answer all these questions and to understand this whole story, the first thing we need to do is to start at the very beginning. So, let's get on with it. From Empire to Neutrality In culture and in the popular imagination, we tend to see Sweden as a calm and moderate state, a bastion of social peace, and a place synonymous with modern social democracy. Of course, this was not always the case. This country's past was much more intimidating. The Swedish Empire was one of the most powerful European powers of the 17th century. At that time, its territory also included present-day Finland, Estonia, and a large part of Norway. But the question is, why are we telling you this on visual politic? Well, because the configuration of the current territory in this region of Europe responds to the events caused by what is known as the Great Northern War. We're talking about a conflict that took place between 1700 and 1721. During those years, the Swedish Empire maintained an armed conflict against Russia, Denmark, and Norway. They were fighting for supremacy in the Baltic Sea. The conflict ended with the Treaty of Nystad in 1721. With this treaty, Sweden was beaten down by Russian Tsarism. And that's not all. A few decades later, between 1808 and 1809, the so-called Finnish War broke out, where Russia again prevailed over Sweden. Following that war, the Grand Duchy of Finland came under the control of Russia. And so, little by little, Russia became a great Baltic power. The sea ceased to be a kind of exclusive lake of the Swedish Empire, and over time became the natural outlet of the Russian fleet to the seas of the world. For its part, Sweden, starting in the 19th century, and after having lost its former imperial grandeur, adopted a policy of neutrality. The reorganization of the state and the development of the country became its main priorities. We're talking about a neutrality that, for more than 150 years, was basically only called into question during the Second World War. Questioned, but not broken. Officially, Sweden did not join either side. And later, in 1949, when World War II had already given way to the Cold War, Stockholm opted to stay out of NATO and declared a security policy based on independence and neutrality. In the 1990s, however, a wave of pro-European enthusiasm swept over Sweden, so that in 1995, the country finally decided to break with its historical state policy and join the European Union. What's more, although it remained outside NATO, it did strengthen its ties with this organization. For example, during all these years, it has participated as an affiliate, as an ally, but not as a member in NATO missions in Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Libya. 
And there's even more. In 2007, Sweden joined Finland, Norway, Estonia, Ireland, Latvia, and Lithuania in the Nordic Battle Group, NBG, one of the European Union's battle groups, whose headquarters are in the Swedish town of Enkerping. A reserve group of 2,400 soldiers from these countries is based there. In other words, Swedish neutrality began to disappear at full speed, something that, believe it or not, Vladimir Putin had nothing to do with. And what, you may ask, did the Russian leader do? Well, basically, he did what he does best. He launched a constant campaign of intimidation. His goal? To prevent Sweden from joining the Atlantic Alliance at all costs. Russian military actions in the Baltic unprecedented. Polish Defense Minister Tomasz Szymanek said most of the activity took place on international waters and airspace, and Sweden was the most affected country. Sweden intercepts Russian military aircraft flying with their transponders turned off over the Baltic region. Russia beefs up Baltic fleet amid NATO tensions. Sweden's defense minister said his country was concerned about the warship's presence in the Baltic Sea and complained that the move would likely keep tensions in the region high. But why does Russia care so much about what countries like Finland or Sweden might do? We'll get to that in a moment in this very video. And as I've already mentioned, the implications of Swedish and Finnish membership are much greater than we might imagine. But for now, what we have to be clear about is that the Russian strategy has not worked. The invasion of Ukraine unleashed unexpected consequences for Russia. If the Kremlin's goal was to put its foot down, in the end, fear of the irrationality of the Russian bear made both Finland and Sweden understand that all that talk of neutrality and going it alone was no longer an option. Being part of NATO was the only real way to guarantee their security. And guess what? As we say around here, no sooner said than done. The NATO flag is already flying at the bases in Helsinki. But why has Sweden's accession to NATO taken so long? Well, basically because there were pending accounts. What exactly are we talking about? Well, we're gonna look at that right now. Pitfalls on the road. Visual politic community, in order for a country to join NATO, all its members have to agree and give their approval. With Finland, that was relatively easy. But in the case of Sweden, well, let's just say that two NATO member countries were determined to make things not so simple. The first country has been Erdogan's Turkey. For months, the Turkish government has alleged that Sweden was backing and harboring militants from Kurdish organizations, that the Turkish government considers terrorist groups and enemies of the state. In addition, until September 2022, Sweden too maintained an embargo on arms sales against Turkey because of Turkey's operations in northern Syria. And of course, with those two precedents, it was clear that negotiations were not going to be a piece of cake. Nevertheless, on 11th of September 2022, there was a change of political colour in Sweden. The government changed from the Social Democrats to a coalition of conservative parties, a change that facilitated the passage of a new anti-terrorism law that, among other things, limited Swedish support for the Kurdish cause. Later, in October, delegates from the Swedish and Turkish Justice Ministries met to discuss some possible extraditions demanded by Ankara. And so, despite the historical friction, everything seemed to be going smoothly. And so it was, until January 2023, when everything blew up yet again. At that time, a Danish activist protested outside the Turkish embassy in Stockholm and burned a copy of the Quran. This sparked major protests in many Arab countries and unleashed the wrath of the Erdogan government. Check it out. We will not say yes to Sweden's entry into NATO as long as you allow our holy book, the Quran, to be burned, torn apart, and to be done with the approval of your security personnel. Of course, some may say that this was all nothing more than a kind of second-rate theatrics. And so Turkey's refusal all this time to accept Sweden's accession may have been a response not only to Ankara's poor relations with Stockholm, but above all, with Washington. Yes, yes, you heard me correctly, with Washington. Let me explain. US-Turkey relations have been pretty bad for years. In fact, President Biden had several arms sales packages to Turkey on the table for months pending approval, among them the sale of the state-of-the-art F-16 aircraft. And since the US was so intent on Sweden joining NATO once and for all, surprise! US clears path for F-16 sales to Turkey amid NATO expansion. You see, Turkey seems to have seized the opportunity to put pressure on Uncle Sam. The other country that has also hindered Sweden's integration has been 
Hungary. Erdogan and Orban, what a duo. The fact is, within the framework of the European Union, Sweden is practically the antithesis of Hungary in practically everything, from immigration to LGBT policies, to social and environmental policy, or the position regarding the war in Ukraine. Sweden threatens to sue Hungary over asylum denials. Sweden's Justice Minister Morgan Johansson and Sweden will challenge Hungary in court unless it starts accepting asylum seekers from other EU countries. Sweden-Hungary relations freeze as diplomatic row escalates. Sweden's Social Democratic Social Affairs Minister Anika Strandhal wrote on Twitter that Prime Minister Viktor Orban's seven-point family planning policy reeks of the 1930s, and that what is happening in Hungary is alarming. Why, why object to Sweden coming into NATO? Because the political relation between Sweden and Hungary is awfully wrong, and we have to improve first. We would not like to import conflicts into NATO first. So first, manage the disagreements between the two countries, and then we are ready to support them. Be that as it may, in the end, Sweden will join NATO. And the question is, the most important question of all, and one that we have yet to answer is, why on earth is the accession of two relatively sparsely populated countries like Sweden and Finland so important for NATO? Why do we say that this is a huge blow to Russia's interests? Why did Moscow want to avoid this scenario at all costs for years? Well, we're gonna take a look at that right now. The final piece of the puzzle. Look at what a 2016 report by the Estonia-based International Centre for Defence and Security said. Without Sweden and Finland in NATO, the alliance lacks strategic and operational depth in the region, as well as sufficient capacity to exercise greater control over sea and airspace in the Baltic Sea. If Russia were to succeed in forcing Stockholm and Helsinki to stay out of a Baltic conflict, NATO's response options would become even more limited, closing NATO's Baltic Gap International Center for Defense and Security. But why is it so important for Sweden and Finland to join NATO? Well, you can see the answer clearly on this map. Following the annexation of Crimea in 2014, the United States conducted a variety of war games to look for strategic weaknesses on NATO's borders. These games showed that the Swedish island of Gotland would play a key role in the hypothetical case of having to defend the Baltic Republics. If Russia were to cut off the Sawaki Corridor and seize Gotland in order to deploy air defense systems there, as you can see on the map, the Baltic Republics would be practically trapped. It would be very difficult to come to their aid, and it would not even be necessary to go that far, with Russia preventing NATO from using that island, a hybrid attack against the Baltics, even with unidentified troops, as already happened in Crimea, could be a nightmare for the Atlantic forces. This is, or rather was, one of Russia's great long-term trump cards. And that is not all. The integration of Finland, and above all, Sweden, into NATO, also wipes out most of Kaliningrad's strategic value. Now, NATO could very easily cut off communications between this territory and the rest of Russia. Let's just say that the Russian Baltic fleet deployed here ceases to be able to move freely. And not only that, in such a conflict scenario, Russia would not even be able to deliver supplies to this enclave. And take note because this reinforces the idea that many analysts have that sooner or later Kaliningrad will end up beyond Russia's borders. Something we will tell you about very soon on Patreon. As a matter of fact, the same is true for the flow of goods in and out of the global market. Russia relies heavily on trade across the Baltic to supply and sell its products to the rest of the world. Now those communications will be subject to NATO's approval. And that's not all either. The Russian Air Force's ability to reach positions in the rest of Europe will also be severely limited. In other words, while for decades the Baltic Sea was a body of water controlled by Russia that gave its navy and its air force access to the very heart of Europe, this is no longer the case. The integration of Finland and Sweden into NATO has nipped that possibility in the bud. In fact, NATO, Finland, and Estonia have already announced ambitious plans to have the capacity to close the Gulf of Finland if necessary. Also, in 2022, Russia announced plans to rebuild its maritime power in the area. Now those plans 
are dead in the water. With the entry of Sweden and Finland into NATO, the Baltic Sea will be surrounded by NATO member states. The goal of establishing Russian maritime power, proclaimed again in 2022 with the publication of the new Russian naval doctrine, would now be unfeasible in this strategically important region, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. And if, with all this, Russia's Baltic fleet is practically history, the future integration of Ukraine into NATO would make the same happen with the Black Sea fleet. But that is another matter. Sticking with the subject of Sweden, although this country has a relatively small army, it brings to the alliance an important military industry. And keep in mind that Swedish factories produce not only small weapons, but advanced systems such as combat aircraft, missiles, tanks, submarines, warships, and air defense platforms. We believe that we will contribute to the defense of the Allies. We don't have an armed forces as numerous as Finland, but we have the most advanced technologies and very powerful defense companies. Teppo Tarjanen, Swedish ambassador to Spain. In other words, Sweden's accession to NATO is without exaggeration, one of the biggest leaps in terms of security for the whole of Europe in recent decades. Putin's special military operation saw Russia go from sharing just 841 kilometers or 522 miles of borders with NATO in 2021 to more than 2,100 kilometers or 1,305 miles after Finland's entry. Now the integration of Sweden will mean that it will basically lose all of its influence in the Baltic Sea. The disaster in strategic terms is colossal. But now it's your turn. How do you think Russia will respond to Sweden's NATO membership? Do you think the next step should be to separate Kaliningrad from the rest of Russia? Leave us your impressions in the comments and let's open up a debate. Now if you found this video interesting don't forget to like it and subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. Again, thank you very much for being here. All the best, and I'll see you next time.